All right, it's going to be 9.05 in just, in just a moment. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. So I would like to uh, first say welcome. My name is Allison Gleason. I'm from Delaware County Community College, and I'm one of the co-chairs of this 47th Annual Delaware Valley Student Affairs Conference Program. On behalf of myself and my conference co-chair, Frank Stern, and the entire conference planning committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the last of our first ever virtual slate of programs. Although the pandemic has thrown a wrench into our normal conference planning process, we're excited to provide the same quality experience in this virtual format. Our DVSAC planning committee has been hard at work since June to make these sessions a success. Uh, and much like any well-planned program, the success is a result of the combined effort of our dedicated team. Our planning committee is a group of student affairs professionals from around the region who have been leveraging their talents in their spare time to put the conference together. At this time, uh, the committee chairs would like to acknowledge our committee and thank them for all of their hard work. Uh, please join us in thanking the committee for all of their time, effort, creativity, and dedication. Right. Uh, that being said, new members are always welcome on the committee to plan the conference and bring in new ideas. If you would like to get involved, please let us know via the reception area. Uh, we do have an interest form. There's a link you can go ahead and fill that out after the session and we will reach out to you as we begin to plan again. We do also have a few housekeeping items. You can always feel free to scroll down this page to view a full session description as well as the speaker's bio. Um, as a reminder, only presenters will be given access to share audio and video. So please use the session chat specifically uh, to comment or ask any questions and we will have dedicated time for Q&A following the presentation and we will be monitoring the chat for any questions and comments. Um, and finally, I would like to introduce our DVSAC committee member, Laura, who worked very hard to make today's session happen. Laura, go ahead and take it away. Good morning again. Um, I'm Laura bickard Sorello, as Allison said. I'm one of the DVSAC committee members and Associate Director for Career Services at Jefferson East Falls. So welcome to our final session of 2021, um, our keynote with Alyssa Carpenter. This morning's keynote is called Humanizing the Virtual Workplace, Creating Community with Students and Staff in 2021 and Beyond. Over the past year, remote work and education has increased at an unprecedented rate. While the convenience of working from home has its upside, it has also left many of us scrambling to effectively engage with students and build camaraderie with our team. In this conversation, we'll explore best practices for establishing communication, communi for establishing and communicating expectations, strategies to authentically build virtual relationships, and how to identify next steps for your organization moving forward. Center for today, Alyssa Carpenter, MED, has been featured in Forbes, NPR, ABC, Fox, CBS, and TEDx as a workplace inclusion expert. With a master's in social and comparative analysis, Alyssa empowers leaders with practical strategies to communicate effectively with their diverse workforce. A former administrator at the Wharton School and a Gallup certified strengths coach, Alyssa has trained thousands of leaders and consulted with multi-billion dollar enterprises to successfully bridge communication gaps across generations, job functions, and geographies. She's also the author of one of Cosmopolitan's top nonfiction books of 2020, How to Listen and How to Be Heard, Inclusive Conversations at Work, the founder of Everything's Not Okay and That's Okay consulting firm, and creator of the DE&I Intention to Action, How to Build, How to Be a Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Changemaker program. So thank you, Alyssa, for joining us today. I'm gonna turn over the floor to you um, to get us started, and then I'll be back again at the end of the session to help wrap things up and assist with the Q&A. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm really excited to be here this morning, and I was chatting with Allison earlier. It's wonderful that we do not have as much snow here, and it seems to be, it seems to be changing a little bit, which is amazing. I wanna make sure that everybody can, can everybody see my, my screen or my PowerPoint. I wanna, okay, awesome, let me, perfect. I'll change it for you in a second. To give you a little bit of background, I've worked in higher education for about 13 years and Laura shared earlier um, working at the Wharton School. 
passionate about the space, I'm so passionate about working with students and really creating these teams across our generations, across um, everything that we're going through today. And, and Allison mentioned, please use that chat function. I'm going to be asking some questions throughout the session today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the workforce and what we can do together. So let me let me get this screen started for you here. So I'm having a little bit of, of difficulty. So to kick things off, I'm curious what your home life looks like. What does your home life look like? If you wanna just chat in the comments for me here, what does your home life look like? Or do you have children at home? Are you home with pets or animals? Um, just tell me in the, in the chat screen what your typical day looks like in your in your home. And can use and you can use that chat function. I would love to see, yeah, home by yourself, husband, yeah, home with pets, home with the screen. Yeah, keep working from home. That's perfect. Yeah, attempting college pets. Yeah, we have so, so much going on right now. Home with two kids. Yeah, that it can be really intimidating and really, really scary to see. And can you see my, I really apologize. Can you see my, my screen right now? Awesome, great PowerPoint, perfect. So, with, with the PowerPoint here, I want to show you my home life right now. So I have two kids at home. Um, sometimes they look like this. Sometimes they're perfectly happy sitting on their, on their screens. Things are looking great. And other times, not so much. Other times we are traveling, we are working, we are going from place to place. And we just don't know what's going on. We just don't know what's happening next. Um, and it can be really, really difficult to be in that position and to be in that space when you're just traveling back and forth. And I know a lot of people, this, I know a lot of people who are trying to do very similar things, who are trying to go back and forth between school and home and working with college students when I was in that space. Over the summer when we would do orientation, I could hear people in the background. I could hear friends, I could hear family, and it can be so distracting um, to have all of those things going on at the same time. So we're all coming from different spaces and different experiences, which makes it, again, very much more difficult to be in there. And sometimes when we're working from home, we don't know where our students are. We can't see them in the background. We don't know what's going on with their life, with their home life. And I'm curious if you can just type in the comments for me here. Have any of you experienced that where you haven't physically seen your students? You haven't been able to be in that space and you haven't been able to see them at all or meet them. Maybe they're freshmen. Maybe they're new within the school. Have you experienced that? And I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear in that comments. Yes, right? It is so difficult. These black rectangles, maybe they have their names on there, maybe not. It is such a struggle to figure out who these students are, right? Each and every day. And you're used to having, yes, welcoming new students virtually is so tough. And you're used to being able to go to their events. You're used to be able to walk into their different spaces and see where they are and see what they're doing. And now that there's this huge disconnect, you're not able to do all of this and, and get to know them on these levels. And what about your staff? Are you able to do that with staff? Are you able to see them? How, how has that been working out too? Are people bracket rectangles on your staff as well? Yeah, your dog. I, again, I have two kids, right? They just keep popping in and out. It is really, really difficult to be able to do that. And we're, yeah, our, our, that's awesome that your staff, Kim, is really interactive on Zoom. Yeah. And 
as higher education educators and being in the space I both worked in student affairs and I worked in academic affairs, you're almost being asked to be Superman, being Spider-Man, being the superhero, which all of you really, really are. Um, we're asked to wear a million hats. And I tell people all the time um, in higher education, if you can work in, in student affairs, you can work in academic affairs, you can work in housing, you can do anything um, because you're being thrown so many different things in so many different directions. But if you're used to creating in-person events and in-person experiences, being able to translate that into virtual events, again, is not, is not as easy as it was before. So are some of the questions that I've been hearing and I've been asking around student affairs professionals who are still in the field, as again, I have my, my business, but I do a lot of consulting work with them and talking with the DBSAC committee, a lot of the questions I was hearing is how can I best serve our students virtually? How can I get to know our students and that I've never met before? How can I get to know them? And more importantly, how can I really help people if this is so new to me as well? Um, if this space is really new to me and I'm unfamiliar with it, you're used to being the ones that people come to for questions and you're used to having the answers. And now we're all going through this together. And as much as I want to say that there is a magic solution or a magic pill or trick or something that we can do to magically make us connect online, to make us connect and be in these spaces, there isn't, but there are different strategies and different tactics that you can take to build community among your students, community among your team, and community among yourselves really within your organization as a whole. And I'm, I'm curious here, if you can type in the comments for me, if you are an individual contributor in your role, or if you're a leader and supervised people, if you can share that with me, that would be great um, over in the comments. Both, awesome. Yeah, both, both. Supervisor, yes. Individual contributor. Great, no, that's so good to know. So again, there's no magic trick, no magic solution that you can possibly take, um, that you can possibly take or do within this setting or within this in this space right so what i want you to think about as we go through this today are things that that people have said that people have done for you your colleague or supervisor if you can type in those comments again thinking about what's one thing that a colleague or supervisor has done within your organization that has really impacted you, that has positively impacted your experience. If you could share that with us in the comments, what's one thing that a supervisor has done for you that has really positively impacted your experience? Again, if you could share that with me in the comments. Being understanding and flexible, I love it. Shared kudos, this is amazing, yes. Being understanding and flexible with timing, being understanding, these are huge. Yeah, what else have colleagues done? What else have supervisors done? Weekly social gatherings, remind us all, understanding about your son popping in, that's huge. Yeah, so tell me for those who have, have shared those things that are supportive to you, remind you to take vacation, to schedule and use it and recognize your hard work. Why is that so impactful for you? Why is it so impactful for you? So why is being understanding so important or why is recognizing your hard work so important? I love that what Allison said, our president was honest, recognizing we're humans, we're struggling. Yeah, Brittany, because my family is a priority, that's major. And what I'm going to be doing as we're talking today, Laura mentioned my book here, I'm going to be giving away 10 copies. So I'll shout out names and I'll let you know and email you afterwards. I'll let you know when you the 10 people can get a copy of the book. These are great. Carrie, human need to under, be understood and appreciated. This is great. My advisor has printed out and color our team, Wordles. These are major. Right? We want to know that people care about us. We want to know that people have our best interest in mind. 
We want to be recognized for our hard work. Now let's flip it a little bit. So we talked about what, what somebody has done for you. So what a colleague or coworker has done for you and why those things were impactful. But what have you done for someone else that either illustrated a thank you or got a thank you out of it or something that you inside felt really good about? That you were like, this, this is why I do what I do. This is why I love doing these things. What has somebody, what have you done for someone else that has really made you think this is amazing? Give a real snow day to my staff. That's huge. Allison, I'm sending you a book. So I'll, I'll let you know afterwards. I'm just going to call out people's names. Send birthday cards. That's amazing. And I'll share some resources later. Valentine's Day gift bags. I love that, Kim. Kim, I'll send you a book as well. Pretty, send gift cards and have pizza, cookies. These are great. These help staff and help you feel connected and help you be connected. Some of the virtual space has allowed us to get back to our counseling roots. This is huge. And I think what some people misunderstand, and I loved when I worked in higher ed trying to explain to people what I did. I don't know if anybody else has this experience. And when I worked on the academic affairs side and people said, oh, you just help students pick classes. I'm like, no, 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 it's so much more than that. It's building those relationships and connections, but it's so hard again to do that virtually when you don't know these students as well or something is missing. Yeah, these are huge. And everything that you're doing is impacting other people. And again, you're building those connections. And the reason is because as humans, we want about these five things, right? We want these five things to build connection or to be within an organization, one of which is safety. And safety, and these are for students as well. So with safety, it can be physical safety right now, right? We want to make sure that we are safe when we're going back to work. We want to feel that we are physically safe. But there's also the psychological safety component. Do I feel safe enough to challenge a status quo? Do I feel safe enough to be there? And a lot of what you're saying is you're creating these spaces where people feel safe. People feel like they can trust you and you're building relationships. A lot of the other things also fall in the second piece, ownership. People want ownership in their work. So if you are in a leadership role, and thank you for sharing those who are and individual contributors, giving your team ownership on a project or a component that they're working on or an idea that they might have. Students also want ownership for what they're doing and ownership for their career or the classes they're taking. They want input, but they want to be able to own it. So two things so far are our safety. We want to be able to provide, and I will share how we do these things. Safety, the psychological safety and physical safety. We want ownership. That third piece is we want to know that people have our back in terms of our energy level. So think about a battery and think about a battery running out and running low. We want someone who's going to help us find that work-life balance, who's going to understand. And I love so many people said um, with your kids and your dog and all these things going on, we want people who can understand that, who can help us work through that and who share with us and have their backgrounds open where you might hear their dogs or see their kids and who are vulnerable. That fourth thing is purpose. We're looking for purpose within our roles. We want to make sure that we are making an impact and we were doing things that matter. And I love what people are sharing in terms of what they did for others and giving that snow day and sharing advice and sharing experience and giving cards of encouragement. Um, these are huge. We don't do what you do in higher ed for the money. Um, and I remember just sitting in different meetings before and supervisors saying, you're not here because of the money. You're here because you're passionate about what you do. You want to make a difference. You want to have purpose. That fifth thing is we want to create spaces where people are cared, where people are caring for us and we care for other people. And the acronym that is the secret sauce to all this, right? I was saying there's no magic pill, there's no magic solution, but there is a secret to making this happen. And the acronym again is BOSS, and we're gonna work through this together. The first is B is building connections. O, open communication. S, set clear expectations. And S, support collaboration and accountability. I want to hear in the comments how you've gotten to know your students virtually and stayed connected with them. How have you, how have you stayed engaged and connected with your team? 
Yes, I'm having difficulty sharing it. I'm not quite sure why. I will send the entire deck um, to your team and then everybody will have access to that too, along with resources. And I will put this in the comments so everybody can share it. Everybody can see it as well. And I apologize, I'm not sure what is going on with the technical issues, but I will, I will have that to you as soon as the presentation is over. So what are some of the ways that you can share with me that you've gotten to get to know your students virtually and stayed connected with your team? How have you made this happen? I love Calendly, yes. Calendly and Sarah, I'll send you a book as well. Um, I remember just working, starting out in higher ed and we did not have, and many maybe potentially organizations and people in their roles here, we didn't have a way for students to schedule appointments. It was just this back and forth email that was beyond frustrating. Um, Calendly's great, it's free. Weekly staff meetings on Zoom, Jamboard, I'll show, I'll give you um, that information later. I love that, Amy. Caitlin, group meetings, collaboration. These are awesome, Kim. We host virtual sessions, wellness nights, follow-ups, check-ins. Canvas, that's great. Tara, student engagement with hosting events. This is awesome. I love it. Allison, setting aside time during meetings with student groups, specifically icebreakers. Yeah, I <laughs> remember um, in person, it's hard to get people to participate sometimes in icebreakers and virtually you kind of have the out um, where we can go like back and not share your screen. During the first year, Laura, yeah. Students expressed missing out on the chat before class. So we started just adding five minutes. I love that. Um, even watching my kids and seeing and talking with other people who, who are children are in college, you're missing that component of sitting next to somebody in class or sitting next to somebody in a meeting. And like, what did you hear? Or what did you eat for lunch? You know, you're, that sidebar conversation that we don't always love to see, um, it's missing. We don't have that extra dynamic. I love that five minutes before meetings. And you can even do five minutes after the meetings as well to make sure you get all the agenda items in first. These are great. Meeting students where they are. This is amazing. So I want to share some suggestions with you in terms of building connections. Um, the first one is show up and be you. One, you showed up here this morning and thank you. Thank you so much for being here this morning. And students want to know you're human. Um, I remember just first again starting out in the field, 22, I had my master's. I thought I had to dress a certain way, I had to act a certain way, and I wasn't connecting as well with my students as I could. Um, I felt like I was putting on a persona because I had to be the older professional or you know whatever that is. And when I worked at, I love this, let them see campus out of the office window. Oh, I love these so much. Um, to show up as you are. And when I was working at Wharton, when we were putting together one of our orientations that we do at the beginning of the year, someone suggested that we all wear suits and this would be a suit event. And a lot of us spoke up and said, but we're, we don't wear suits in the office every day. We usually wear jeans, maybe a nice top, like wearing a suit makes us come across as really stiff and that's not who we are. So really keeping with that and identifying, you know, how do you want to show up for your students? How do you want to be there? Um, and I really appreciate everybody being so forgiving in terms of not being able to see, um, and there were just images, not being able to see some of the images that I wanted to share with you. We're going to make mistakes. We are not perfect. This is very new to everyone everybody and we're learning and being vulnerable and sharing, students appreciate that, teams appreciate that. I don't wanna work for somebody who's always perfect um, and nothing ever goes wrong and their kids are always sleeping and never in the background, right? Being us and showing who we are is so, so helpful. And yes, and I love what Parker's saying, when working with a foreign national, share stories from my own travels. Yes, it's connecting. It's building those connections with students. Um, the second one so one in terms of building connections is show up right show up and be you be who you authentically are um, a lot of people already mentioned this but sending virtual or mail thank you cards i think is major um, i will share resources again afterwards i will give you the entire deck as well as uh, resources that you're able to to use, um, one of which is Paperless Post, which I use all the time. It's a free e-card service. And 
I put things in my calendar. I live by my calendar. And I put things in my calendar like um, birthdays, special occasions. If you have access to student birthdays, you can send out these cards and you can pre-schedule them. You can send them to one card. You can create and send it to a lot of people. The students want to know that you're thinking about them, that you care. Um, if you would have said happy birthday in person, this is just that the extra piece. Same with staff. Um, it's really quick and easy to do. I pre-schedule different cards and events and put it on my calendar. It just it makes it more more personal. Yes, I agree with you, Kim. They love it when your birthday is acknowledged. They love that you know experience, and, it, and it's free to be able to do. Um, the third piece about building connections is going to your go-to students, and this is not to say you find your token student and identify them and then they speak for all students, right? But we all have those, those students who you connect really well with and can help you get and navigate and figure out where your students are. And somebody mentioned earlier, go to where your students are. And that's my fourth point with connections, is meet them where they are. How are they currently connecting with your office? And I'd love to hear in the chat how students are currently connecting with your office. People don't know that you exist, especially if they're coming from high school, this is their first year, they don't know maybe all the resources that the school offers, they're not familiar. So if we're not actively going out and meeting students where they are, how they're reaching out to us, we could be missing out on so many people. Um, and I'd love to hear again in the chat, where are your students hanging out? Where is their online um, hangout? Or how are they connecting with your office? What social media or what channels are they using to be able to connect with your office? Again, Tara saying you host virtual events to try to engage student Facebook group. That's great. That's awesome. In the student center, we try to show virtual tours. That's great. Instagram, Discord, these are huge. So knowing where your students are is major and you can go to them and you can find them. It's, it's much harder for them to come to you to know how to reach out for you. Social media, email, struggling to get students at home, virtual, reaching a few students. So talk to your go-to students or your students who might know where other students are hanging out online so you're able to best connect with them. Yes, Discord is, is great. Um, a lot of students are using that as well. Yeah, I've been doing class visits, hopping in. If you're connected with professors, especially if you're in the academic affairs space or you're um, working with student groups and you have a faculty sponsor, see if they have classes that you can hop in on. Are there first year courses with some of your colleagues are teaching and maybe you can hop in, like, it's funny because it's the name of the platform. If you can hop in with them um, into their class and do these virtual visits and let them know a little bit about your services and, and pair with a faculty member, go meet them where they are. Also for, you know, thinking about other creative ways. So open communication would be the second. So we have the building connections and open communication is the second. And somebody mentioned here um, hosting office hours or hosting those spaces, doing Facebook Lives, those are awesome. Finding again where those students are. Um, Facebook Live could be something that works for some students that could be really, really helpful. IGTV, um, hosting videos and keeping them on your social channel for always, and it could be simple things. Um, and a lot of people use Loom in terms of doing a screen record of how to register for classes or how to register a student group or how to apply for a leadership position. You can do quick videos and keep them on your IG channel and have them as little thumbnails so students can go back to them. Use certain hashtags and have those hashtags. Um, emailing and connecting with student group leaders now might be as we're gearing towards, it might be midterms or or um, election time or some key points, reaching out to the leaders to see what they need, to see who might be taking on new positions, getting email addresses, you know, seeing what might work that way. I love Anne saying, and Anne, I'll send you a book as well. So Anne mentioned that their team is doing micro programming, 15 minutes within the context of classes, teasers for services. I love that. Encouraging faculty announcements to online students 
using Screen Recorder, yes. Um, Loom, L-O-O-M, is a great feature if you're not familiar with it. Um, you can do it free and it's a screen record and you can just screen record different things. So thinking about and looking at what students typically ask you all the time, the questions that they're, they're asking you, you can start to record them in these very short videos. And I love Lisa saying that they're engaging a lot on Instagram, tag a friend. Yes, you can use these features. So if you're on Instagram and doing a post on um, new activities or new events, tag a friend who might be interested in it. Or, you know, you can do a giveaway. We see a lot of influencers doing giveaways. If you tag five friends and each follow your social media channel, every and then you pick a winner and people get a $10 gift certificate to school store, Apple, Amazon, AirPods, whatever that is, you want to build up that that following and not for numbers sake, but for people to be able to get that information. So yes, people love fun incentives. Um, I also for open communication, I call them loop days. I think sometimes you can easily get on. Um, we're trying to be creative, doing all these things, maybe having student calls or emails, and then we forget um, to close the loop on certain things or a project was happening. It can be really frustrating if your supervisor is asking you to do some work or get things done and never gets back to you about something. I like to call them loop days because I create a list of things that I wasn't able to get to or emails that I wasn't able to get to. And then I'll block off an hour, two hours, half day, 30 minutes and go back and close all those communication loops. So who didn't I get back to about A, B, C, and then that whole time you're much more productive because you're closing all of those loops. So we want to keep the lines of open communication, but in order to build trust, in order to, to keep those lines open, we need to follow up and follow through. And I found that blocking that time off was really helpful for me. Another option, has anybody used Clubhouse before? I'd love to hear in the, in the chat if anybody's used Clubhouse. So there are two, two other alternative ways to meeting students where they are. Um, one is Clubhouse and I'm again dating myself of saying, I think it's more like an AOL chat room, but with voice. Um, I use it a lot professionally. There are a lot of different people using Clubhouse. You can host a Clubhouse session. If anybody is not familiar, it right now there are some negative aspects in the way that is one invitation only and only available for iOS or Apple devices. But I will give my email at the end and the first two people, I have two more invitations left. The first two people who email me, uh, I can invite you to Clubhouse if you want to check it out and see what it is. But a lot of students are hanging out on Clubhouse and having conversations. You can host a session about an event that you're having. You can do a virtual event online. If you notice a student group is already using Clubhouse, you can hop on there and have that conversation. So it's a great, great thing. Has anybody hosted an Ask Me Anything session? It's only for iPhone. Yes. So there's two negatives. One, um, one being that it's only for iPhone and iOS devices, and two, it's invitation only. So I do have again two invitations, and I'll send. I'll have my email um, at the end, and then to be able to email me, and I can give two invitations to people. I have two left. If you want to check it out and see, it will. I'm sure. I don't think the social media is this one is going away anytime soon. And I can see more and more people using it, and more students using it, especially because a lot of people are afraid of, of the camera and being seen. With this, it's audio and voice only. Um, so I happily share the two invitations that I have if anybody's interested in checking out. But it can be a way to connect with some students. Has anybody used the Reddit app before, or Reddit before, in terms of Ask Me Anything sessions? And you can type in the chat for me. I'm going to look through at the same time and see what other people have said. So another, so yeah, students use it a lot. Yeah, I have, I'm overwhelmed by it um, a little bit, but students use Reddit a lot. Um, they'll Google a question, Reddit will come up, and it's a forum where people ask questions and anybody can answer. I, 
I've seen a lot of student affairs professionals use Reddit for ask me anything sessions. It could be ask me anything about course registration, ask me anything about being a student leader, ask me anything about X or Y or Z. You can host them as a professional and you can host these sessions. You can ask student leaders to host these sessions. And what's awesome is now you have some data. What are students consistently asking you? What are questions that they have? And from there, you can create short videos. You can go back to your students and ask different questions. So you have this, this information center of the types of questions that students are asking in a place where they're going. The questionable content can be difficult um, to get around, and I'm not as familiar with the nuances of that, but I believe you can, you can remove stuff. You have the thread, so you create your own thread. And they're always, and Kim's right, and this may or may not work for everybody, but in terms of what do you do with negative people, people ask on social media, people can ask a negative question. And there's, you know, some nuance to that and how you can respond to that information or the resources that you can send them. But all in all, I think it might be a good way to start collecting information. And you're going to have negative information or um, criticism regardless, whether if it's in person or, or out in the, in the virtual space. Um, so just being aware of that and, and really being proactive in your communication back. Um, and you can always ask for help from people within your organization to be a resource in that space too, of how do we respond to these requests or what do we say? But I do think Reddit could be a good option for you. Um, in terms of expectations, I'm, I'm curious how you set expectations with your staff. How does your staff know right now what is due and when it's due and, and what you're working on? If you can just let me know in the, in the comments how you're making that happen, how you're setting those clear expectations. And it's tricky. And we're coming up on almost a year at this point um, in terms of of COVID, you know, figuring out what's happening next, deadlines with dates, daily check-ins, Google Docs, bi-weekly meetings, reminders, and invites. That's great. You've shared calendar and work together, homework. This is amazing. Yeah. And I think it's so important, too, to set expectations with students as well. Um, I know sometimes we're not sure a student emails you and they expect immediate response or a staff member emails you expecting immediate response and continuing to have these open conversations. If you're having these one-on-one -on -one conversations, asking questions, how should I be keeping track of what I'm working on? Or are there specific hours that I should be working? How do you like to be updated on projects? Or what should be our primary ways of communication? Or what expectations do you have for one another and for me as your supervisor? So keeping that conversation, again, I'll send you all these questions as well. Um, but keeping those lines of communication open is really, really crucial because when we don't know when things are due, we don't know the hours, it can be a cause of contention. And same for students. They don't know how to reach you. They don't know how to keep in touch. As students have always been, yeah, communications before COVID too. We always defer to emails. Um, I feel a lot of people defer to emails and that can be really overwhelming and that could be something that gets lost in an inbox. I'm curious how many um, text students, how many people um, use texting as a form of communication for students? Group me, yeah. DMs through Slack. I love that using students through Slack. Yes, and that can be great for student groups. Text often, text teams. So sometimes I was, I didn't necessarily want to give the students my personal cell phone. Yes, and text through my Google Voice number. And, and afterwards, um, I have a whole list of resources, one of which is how to get a Google Voice number. Um, I think that's really helpful if you have a relationship where you might be texting a student, but you don't want them to have your personal cell phone number. Google Voice is great um, to be able to do that in Teams. Yes. Yeah, so there's just different options that you can do. But the key is to support those conversations and to be very clear. What is the best way to communicate with you every day? What is the best way for me to communicate with you during emergencies? And keeping that line open consistently and constantly with the conversations with your team. And there's never um, 
too many conversations. There's always things that are happening. And as we towards the end of the year and we're having, you're going to start to do orientation or graduations or all of these big events are coming up. This is all new again territory because are we going to do these things in person or virtually or what projects are in place and what need to stay behind? Consistently have these conversations as a supervisor with your team, but as an individual contributor, ask your you know supervisor, this is what we did last year. Are we still working on this? Is this still a priority or should I be working on this? All of this needs to be open communication so you can set those expectations with one another. Yeah, this is awesome. So in terms of supporting collaboration, so we're at that fourth S now. Um, we talked uh, about building connections and open communication, and I wanna to touch upon the supporting collaboration and accountability. Have any of you tried out doing co-working virtual sessions? So there's so much research around that we're craving working with people, we're craving this this need to be around people, but not necessarily in a million meetings, right? Going from meeting, meeting, meeting isn't as helpful in building those connections. A co-working session is if you're using Zoom or Teams, you can put yourself on mute, you don't have to have your camera on, but somebody's on that other side. So if you have a question, you can unmute, you can put your camera on, and you can work together through a problem or solution. So you are working with someone in a different space, but you're working together. Um, and creating that concept with your team, if you're just wanting somebody on the other end of that line has worked really, really well. I do it with some of my colleagues now in this space. I know a lot of student affairs professionals who started doing that and working together without being physically together. So you still can ask that question. Um, sometimes I think too, we reinvent the wheel a little bit. I know that I I can fall into that trap. But now we have, again, I feel like you're all superheroes being in the student affairs space and, and working with students and so much going on. There's not time or brain power to reinvent the wheel. There is so, so much information out there. And everybody on this call today and everybody in this chat today has a wealth of knowledge that you might not even realize that you have about what somebody else is looking for. So use this group, use the connections and say, I'm working on this particular project, do you have anything similar to that? Or do you have experience in this space? And share that information and share that with each other because it, it's just too much to start to take all that ownership and do everything on yourself. So supporting one another and supporting that collaboration is really crucial. I noticed too that a lot of people were sharing the team huddle aspect. And we used to do that in person in one of my previous roles where every morning, 15 minutes, we got up, um, went in somebody's office and just did these standing meetings to make sure everything was in place to make sure we made that happen. And you can also do that virtually if every Monday or Wednesday or Friday or every day, whatever you need to do if it's a busy time, doing something in the morning and getting getting that out of the way so people don't feel like they're left behind. People don't feel like they're ever not able to, to do something or be able to move forward. Yes, yeah, I love that. We're starting to use standing meeting approach. And, and honestly, people don't wanna stand for more than 15 minutes. So even if you say this is a virtual standing meeting, people don't wanna just hang around for more of that time. Yeah, and if you know it's 15 minutes, we need to do a lot in this period of time. Um, I'm also a huge fan of adjusting meeting length because then I think it supports the collaboration because the time is shorter, you know what you need to do. And what I mean by that is often we defer to 30 minutes, 60 minutes, an hour, you know, an hour and a half, whatever that is. Thinking about meeting times differently, 25 minutes, 55 minutes, 20 minutes, 50 minutes. One, that gives you as an individual some time for some breather, go to the bathroom, do what you need to do for those five or 10 minutes in between, or else you're rushing from meeting to meeting. So instead of 20, instead of 30 minute meetings, hosting 25 minute meetings, giving that five minute leeway for you to virtually get to that next meeting, hosting that 15 minute 50 minute meeting, giving you 10 minutes to catch up on work, right? I'm a huge fan of not having a meeting just for the sake of meetings. And I love, and Sally, I'll send you a book as well. Um, huge fan of breaks in between. Um, when I was working in higher education, we came as a team and said, okay, we would see three students, then you can do a 30 minute prep time. See three students, do a 30 minute prep time. 
And depending how your team is or how the culture is, you might be the only one who controls your calendar and that's amazing. If not, have those conversations and start blocking out time for yourself because we cannot be creative, we cannot build connections if we don't have any space to be able to do it. Um, so having those, those 30 minutes spaces, those five, those 10 minutes can help you a lot to hold each other accountable and then to collaborate. I'm also a huge fan of taking photos of things. Um, my phone is filled with photos, whether it's slide decks or different things that I want to add in different spaces. If you're having issues, if there's a sticky point um, within your team, you're like, why is this platform not working? This is the error message I keep getting. Or why are students not able to register for this or, or talk about this or do this? You can do screenshots of where it is and then keep them in a folder. Then when you're meeting with your team and ask your team to do the same thing, looking through those things, are there common issues? Are there common things that need to be resolved? Um, when we did that as a team, we we realized we were having so many back and forth emails of why am I getting so many emails to schedule that we decided to invest in an online scheduler for our students. So finding these issues and maybe you're not a picture person, maybe you don't like to do screenshots or take photos, but writing it down and keeping that list so you can better work together because you're solving all those, those kinks in there, which is huge. So I would love to hear what additional tools you're using for whether it's collaboration or connecting and I'll share some of mine and again at the end I will also give people um, the slide the slide deck as well as the links to the resources that I'm going to share with you right now what are some tools and I saw Microsoft Teams I saw Slack I saw Calendly I'm going to look through here and I'll share, I'll share some of mine as well. Um, Google Voice to me is, is huge. Um, a lot of students want to chat or maybe you wanna chat with your colleagues, don't necessarily wanna give them your personal phone. Google Voice is great because you have a different phone number, but you can still use the same device that you have. Padlet's awesome. Yeah, virtual events, Jabber. And I'll look through all these and I can add these as well. WhatsApp is amazing. There's another um, feature that, that I really like, especially to hold key people accountable. If your team is saying, this is our goal, this is what we're gonna do, and this is when we're gonna do it by, emailfuture.com, you are creating a goal and it will send you a reminder email as well as for other people, a reminder email of what your goal is. So if you set this goal for 30 days, you'll get an email in 30 days along with the rest of your group saying, this is your goal. It's a future note to yourself. We should have done this or we're working towards Towards this. Um, I love that. I think you can use that with your students, when you're in your students' groups and trying to build connections, give you a way to circle back to them and close a loop on those loop days. You know, did we follow through on this? What are we working through? What does this look like for this event that we have? Um, Slack and Trello. Again, I'll send you a whole list of actually project management tools that you can use. With that said, I'm not a fan of just adding tools for the sake of using tools. So it's first identifying what is the need, what is something is missing, and then how can we find the tool to use it? These are great. NMZ Blocks, Calendar, yeah, these are amazing. Um, does anybody use templates? Does anybody use template emails in their Outlook? You can just type in the chat for me. Bit of overwhelm, right? I agree, Kim, right? So Slack and GroupMe and Teams and Asana, what it and, and figuring out what is working, what's not working. Is there a way to consolidate that? Because it's using so much of your time and you're not building connections that way because you're so dispersed in different spaces. Love templates. So if anybody is not familiar with template emails, again, I'll send you a link to how to create these emails. It's so much easier if people are consistently and constantly asking you the same question about something, whether it is students, um, about when an event is, or um, how to apply for a particular position, or where something is located. You can have and create a template email where it's just a click of a button, the email populates, you can change the student name, you can change the dates, you can change the, the registration information or the application, and then send it away. Um, so you're not wasting time doing that, and then you can really close the loop, building connections, showing trust, and then do actually what you need to do. Yes, during a lot during registration times, I would do the same thing when students would ask me when is 
is registration start? When is a drop ad period? When can I um, add an additional half CU for a half semester for classes? It would be so helpful. I agree, Darcy. Yes, exactly. When, especially when you're working with faculty, as Darcy is saying, to keep these things together, if it's the, the same thing over and over again. Automatic replies for Outlook as well can, again, keep be really helpful. We usually use automatic replies for vacation of I'm not here this day, but you can automatically, again, talk with your team and see if this would be helpful. But an automatic reply going out all the time, if you can't reach me via email, here are the other avenues or other channels that you can reach me. Here's the phone number to our office, or here is our Facebook. Um, we're going to be hosting this Facebook Live. So at an automatic reply for your emails doesn't have to come just when you're on vacation. If people are having trouble contacting you and you're not able to find them, having that automatically go to them of these are the ways that they can reach you is huge. Yeah, I'd love to hear what other, what other ways as well. Um, and another document that I'll send you to, again, creating that connection, creating a community, and creating those expectations is doing a README, is creating a document for your staff of how they can get in touch with you. What are your expectations? Why did you take this job? Um, there are a ton of different options for a README, but when you're onboarding people, it's so great to know um, where your where your priorities are, or is the best way to contact you via email, or how do you expect feedback, or how do you give feedback? So it's giving people in the short document a little bit about you. Do you have kids? Do you have a dog? Do you prefer Zoom calls? It's getting a little bit more in depth about you as well. These are awesome. I love this so much. So I want you to, to type in the comments for me just one thing that you're going to try out. What's one thing that you think that you're going to try out to do a tool, a strategy? How are you going to connect? Is it going to be creating a readme or using templates or trying out Jamboard, which I love? Um, what are some of the things that you, yeah, templates, this is great. What other things that you're going to try? Meeting margins, birthday cards, these are amazing. Oh, I love no meeting zones. Yeah, try out Loom. These are so great. Melissa, yeah, these are amazing. Your template folder, future.com. To set aside time for yourself. And it is so hard. And I think being in the profession that you're in, it is a, a caring profession, a helping profession. You are doing this because you want to help people. You want to do good. You want to create spaces where people are seen and they're valued and you're heard. And it is exhausting. It is mentally exhausting. And to it's so important to take time for yourself and, and figuring out ways to do that. If that's small increments of these five to 10 minutes in between meetings, scheduling other blocks, asking your supervisor to, to change that schedule a little bit, just people seeing your life. And, you know, it's sometimes hard if people don't have their, their camera on, but if you're comfortable with it when working with a student, do it. You might be the only person that students have seen this whole time. Right, having that conversation with your team of are you using your camera? Where do you have weight? Where do you have influence or wiggle room within your organization to talk about the importance of using your camera with other staff um, for students? St students want to see what's going on behind the scenes here. Um, even when working in in an office physically, when I was in higher ed, I tried to have as much kind of personal stuff, and you're telling personal stories, and, and you're building that connection, but they're physically in your home um, of what's going on, and and usually people will open up a little bit more when, when they hear that. Oh, I love this so much, understanding and supervisors. Yeah, it's been different this year, for sure. These are so wonderful. I'd love to hear more of like one thing that you're thinking that you're going to try to do. What is one thing that you're kind of try to do to connect with with your students? And Laura, I love that students are so forgiving. Um, they really are, and I think sometimes we we're not sure um, if we want you know, want to share this information or we want to do this. And I will say, like students bought um, like gifts for when I had my baby. Like they're invested in you. You're invested in them. Um, they know that you care. You were there for them. If you're putting that out to them, and they genuinely know that you're there to help and support them and learn and grow, um, 
they will be there for you um, in terms of kind of what's happening and you're laughing and you're building that relationship and that rapport because it's so much more than coming to you about being a student leader or choosing a class or, play, or being um, working towards orientation. You when you look back at your college experience, and I'm sure many of you, this is why you've been doing this, is you're the people who are making such a big difference. And yes, you have classes and you have all these other things, but but this is about building those connections and making people feel like they're part of something, making people feel like they're part of a community. Now, these are amazing. I love this so much. And again, I'll share um, the the deck with you so everybody will have that. But I want you to think about the, the three things that we talked about. Again, there's no magic pill, there's no magic solution that we can do to make everything go away and we're all gonna be connected together. There's, there's nothing like that, but there are things that we can do. We can build connections with each other, right? We can open those lines of communication with one another. We can meet students where they are, finding out where are they hanging out. Is it a Reddit session that we're going to be hosting, an IGTV, small videos, where are they virtually hanging out? And setting clear expectations for yourself too, that you're going to have some self-care, you're going to have some time to reflect for your team, when are things due, what does that look like for your students? When the, an automatic reply goes out to them, you can expect a reply back from me within 24 or 48 hours. I can also be reached here, right? So setting those clear expectations and working with one another and supporting that collaboration, reinventing the wheel is it's not the time to continue to do that right now. So looking at the wonderful people here today, the people within your organization that you can really use as a resource and then holding one another accountable and thinking maybe it's email future, it's closing that loop and scheduling those loop days. So we know that we're holding ourselves and we're holding one another accountable. This is so awesome. And I, I'd love to open it up for questions. And I'm going to look through the, the chat as I was looking through it now. Um, but I want to open it up for questions. And it can be about anything that we talked about, something that you may be struggling with, a question that you might have when I was talking about not reinventing the wheel, a question you might have in terms of connecting and what other people have done. Let's use this group as just a great resource for one another so we can help each other build those connections from now and, and moving forward. So I'm going to look through the comments too here. These are so great. Oh, I love what, what Parker was saying during advising sessions. I ask if they have a contact in the field they want to enter. If not, I share contacts for my personal network. That's amazing. Again, it's building the connections elsewhere. And this is a beyond, right? We're building those connections, that community from 2021 and beyond. And maybe you, um, Parker don't necessarily, and I'll send you a book as well, don't have that connection, but maybe they're not familiar and your organization has a list of alumni um, that they're able to reach out to in the field. Maybe somebody within your organization and career services would be a good contact for them and to have that. Maybe there's a LinkedIn group that they might not be aware of. Um, asking those questions, people don't know what to ask because they don't know what they don't know. So asking those initial questions and gauging can really prompt up some amazing information. Yes, that's huge, Preeti, that we need to be respectful of student spaces online. You don't want to invade every space they have. Yep, it's good to remember boundaries too. Yep, and when I'm saying go on Facebook, it's not spam their DMs everywhere and ask them questions. It would be hosting different sessions, letting people know that you're there um, if they need them. And I've been trying to figure out a bigger word for Zoom fatigue. Um, I think it's like beyond burnout at this point. It's so much. Um, it's just a lot. You're looking at yourself. You're looking at other people. If you are using Zoom, there's a new feature where you can actually disable looking at yourself and that camera, which does help a little bit. Um, it's still not making you not Zoom fatigued, um, but that's an additional feature. But but be real and, and saying to students, I know I'm burnt out from using Zoom all the time. How are you doing? How are you coping? Is there a different way that's easier for you to meet, right? Just being real and honest. Great question, Melissa. If you are an individual contributor, how can you encourage your department or supervisor to be more team oriented? Our office is very student focused, which is great, but I feel like our team is not connected since we went remote. 
And it's interesting because we, I think we use team a lot. Um, and when I've been within organizations and we are a team, we are essentially people who are doing the same function in a group. We don't necessarily operate as a team or as a unit. We are all advisors or we are all um, career counselors. We are all doing the same tasks, but we don't operate together. And I think part of it would be reaching out, even it can be directly to your supervisor, it can be to another member of your team and asking them if they want to do a, a virtual chat or a virtual lunch or talking with your, your supervisor about it and saying, I feel a little disconnected as, as a team. I really liked when we did things together or got to know one another. Are we able to do, and it can be a team building activity. It can be somebody, um, like door dashing lunch for everybody, letting them know. Um, I think sometimes, again, you don't know what you don't know. So a supervisor might not know that's what you're craving or what you're looking for or what you want. Um, and having shared documents that you're able to see where are people, where are you struggling with? Starting, even Melissa suggesting maybe a couple of your colleagues, are you interested in doing a virtual co-working session? We don't have to have our cameras on, we can be muted, but I I miss sitting near you in the office and I, I miss seeing you um, just in case we have any questions. Does anybody have any suggestions of what they've done within their, their group to be more team oriented and more connected in that way? And again, I'm gonna keep looking through the comments. play games. Yeah, I love it. It gets them engaged and in a good mood. Um, it's, it's talking to student affairs professionals. I feel like we do team building things so many times. I can send you two and I'll add it to the list. Um, I have a virtual deck of pictures where there's a lot of activities that you can do with them and it kind of kicks things off where you look through these pictures, tell me um, what does communication mean to you or what does leadership mean to you or whatever prompt you want or find a picture that represents leadership and, and using these virtual photos to do that. I think, you know, you don't know how to express things sometimes and using something tangible like a photo and then you're able to pull out what those things mean. Tell us about your favorite vacation. I'm also big on if your team has access to Legos or something like that, show me um, what this looks like or tell me how you interact with students or whatever that case is using something that's tangible and building it and then people are done describing that thing within that within that area um, people do love your right Kim competition you can do Pictionary you can do all that stuff um, via zoom too I love that yeah but and and that's so true what people want very different things. Um, when you're, we were talking earlier about what does your house look like and, and being home, you have animals, you have kids, being respectful and understanding just the, where people are and, and their differences um, in terms of what they need or what they want. And even asking, um, I think sometimes we make assumptions and I know I do, like this is my situation, my kids are home for virtual school, I'm making the assumption that yours might be too or that your schedule is very similar. So asking what, what do you need from me to be successful or what do you need from me or how can we change things? I'm also sending around a time zone converter. For some reason, converting things into different time zones has been really difficult for me. Um, when you're talking about student events, when you plan an event for 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, not a problem. 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, everybody is here in this Philadelphia area. Um, but when you're planning virtual events for people who are students within your institution, they can be all over the world. Um, so being aware and asking the best time to host different virtual events and changing that up um, within your student groups. If you have students who are all over the world and you're hosting student meetings and you're their supervisor in that capacity, changing those things up and figuring out different times that, that work for, for different members of your, your student groups. I love this so much. Game of games. Yeah. What other questions do you have in terms of in terms of communicating, connecting, what's going on in your teams. And Amanda's suggesting, yep, setting up random lunches. People don't necessarily know that you're interested in doing a lunch unless you ask. Um, so if that is something that you wanna do or you're interested in or you wanna meet people, sending that email, sending that invite, texting, however you're communicating with that individual and asking for that can be really helpful. 
scavenger hunts. Yes, I love that. We do scavenger hunts too. Um, here's a list of things. First one to come back with these five things, get a prize. Yeah, these are so great. That's so wonderful. And Parker saying, um, with everyone doing a lot of cooking at home, we're sharing a lot of recipes with each other. I've done virtual um, either tastings or virtual cooking together, virtual cooking classes together. So if you're just looking for that way to, to bond and you're used to doing different events, we would always have an end of the year event. Um, summer solstice, we would do another event. So things got moved virtually. Um, when that happens. So you can do cooking classes, sending people boxes of stuff. So you can all work together if you if you want to do that or different tastings. And LJ is asking, I have a lot of favorite games, but LJ is asking if anybody has a favorite game that they play with their team. Oh, I love that. And Darcy, walking 400 miles this calendar year. Um, I do not have a Peloton bike, but I have the app. Um, and I've been using the the bike and tracking that and been doing competitions with each other. I know a lot of people have been doing something similar to get people active and get people moving. Um, and if you're if that's a competition between your team of, okay, we need to do 400 miles, you know, going back of saying, I can't do 400 miles if I'm just sitting here in meetings all day. So let's do 10 minute breaks in between, or let's do 30 minute breaks in between um, to be able to do that. Kim saying, I started this uh, pre-pandemic. They were like zombies during training planning meetings, so I needed to find a way to, to liven them up. Yeah, instead of screen time, many of my university will say, let's take a walk outside. Huge. I I didn't think I could before, but I realized um, I'll put on my, my your AirPods, your headphones, take a walk outside and have, you know, have a work call or have those 15 minute chats. If you want to get to know people, just, you know, take it outside, take, take that walk, take those minutes um, with one another. And the conversations don't have to be about work. Um, and sometimes we always default to how are you? How's your day? What are you doing this weekend? But those are, can be maybe more closed questions versus more open-ended questions. Or tell me about a project or an assignment that you are really proud of. Tell me about a student you're really excited about or a student that you're really nervous about. What events are you really looking forward to? What events are you really nervous about? Um, asking more open-ended questions. And I know many people may know this, but, but tweaking and changing the way we question things can lead to more, not only from your staff, but also from your students. I check in with them about self-care and taking a day off. That's major because I think sometimes we don't think about taking the day off um, because you're home, right? You're home and you're not going anywhere and you're not doing anything. But one, you as a leader and as a supervisor, if you're modeling that and you're taking that day off and saying, I, I need a mental health day, I need to take um, a day for myself, you're showing your team that that's important. And then reaching out to your team members and saying, you know, how are you doing? I was really exhausted. How's it going? And again, you're building that community. You're building that connection. Um, it's harder these days, um, but doing something together virtually in terms of volunteer work can be a great way to build community. You can still do different clothing drives or food drives or, or things like that if you're dropping things off at a physical location, but talking to your team about what causes are important to them, what are they passionate about, how can you give back together. Same with students, um, what's important to them, how can you work together um, to be able to do that. We're doing, when you're talking about giveaways, and we talked about this before, if you're doing a social media giveaway of, you know, tag your friends who might be interested in coming to this event, we're going to pull from, we're going to pull 10 winners. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. I think sometimes we think um, gift cards or AirPods or something like that. It can be the winners will choose a charity of their choice. The winners will choose a social justice cause of their choice where we will donate money, funds, time, whatever that is. Um, so tweaking those giveaways a little bit, there's only so much stuff that we can all have. Um, so that could be really helpful and it shows that you care, you're building connections, you can ask people about it. Um, also doing student features, if they're comfortable using your social media, you can do social media takeovers of different days, um, giving students access to those channels to do uh, ask me anything session on your Facebook, to ask me anything session in Facebook uh, on Instagram Live or, or anything like that. They're able to do that and, and answer those questions too. These are amazing. And so I give them an escape, yeah, an hour. 
Yep, to get back to their day. Yes. And again, I'm going to look through to see what other questions popped up. But there's just so many good nuggets here. What else have people done to connect better with students, to create that community? What other tools have you used? And Carrie asked a great question, um, and I'd love to hear too in the comments, how do you reach students that aren't engaged? How do you reach students that just aren't getting back to you, who aren't um, engaged with, your, with you, with the organization, with your team? How do you reach out to them? Yeah, I've, and Kim's saying, our interns started doing behind the mask, our Instagram, shows our student staff, yes. And you can even take pictures of your office space. What does your office space look like at home? What does your day look like? And kind of post those, engage with students in that way. Yeah, but I do, I do think Kim asked such a great question. Um, before, how do you engage with students who just aren't reaching out to you? who aren't connecting with your office. And I'll say, I definitely had that even in person. There are students that you're just not going to see. Um, and sometimes I could physically go, um, I knew in their classes, if I knew something was wrong, if I knew something, um, I had talked to them before, I knew there's some mental health issues, I could find them and we had that relationship or that would be okay. Um, how have you been able to do that virtually? I'm curious from other people, um, have you been able to find the students who haven't been able to do it? Yeah, great question. And then I'll come back to the, the other one. What about asynchronous forms of engagement? My students are all adult learners with a ton on their plates, so we typically get very little engagement with synchronous events because of their limited time. Um, I'm curious from everybody else's experience too, what have you done that are more like, um, I don't want to say static, but something that they can reference later or they can look back later. And I think social media could be one of those things um, if you want if you want to do that. Those micro sessions could be one of those things where they're going online and doing things at their own pace. Um, different contests can be something in that way. And then doing the prizes of, of especially for an adult learner, can be um, like a charity or social justice issue of their of their interest. Yeah, I'm curious, type in the comments too and let me know what asynchronous things have you done? And asynchronous can even to me mean um, like a virtual tour, a virtual tour of an office, a space, um, walking through how a process is. Um, sometimes we're afraid. I know even when I worked with students over the summer and it was virtual, people just don't know what to expect when they talk to a career advisor or they talk to an academic advisor or somebody else um, in student affairs, they don't know. Um, so even having a way to share with them how this works will help people and, and peel that back a little bit, will help people wanna reach out to you a little bit more so they're not afraid and they're not nervous. I like that. I have success with take and make events on campus for students to pick up and do at their own time. And that could be for, for anything. Um, even if they're not physically within that space, things can be mailed um, where they can do their own, their project or their own meal or whatever that is. Oh, I like that. A temple on Instagram, their colleague is getting, yeah, so much engagement with take and makes. I love it. That's huge, thank you. What other questions are, do you have or what other things are, are popping up for you um, as you're working through and trying to get connected with your team? So thinking about your, your team, how are you connecting with them? What are some other tools that you're using, some other strategies that are going on? Yeah, I'm gonna look through these. These are so great. Or better question, how are you taking time for yourself? How are you taking time for yourself so you can help other people? So thinking about self-care, are you taking vacation days? Are you blocking out different times on your calendar? Are you letting other people know? How are you taking care of yourself during this time? I 
just some great comments here. So type in that chat for me. How are you taking care of yourself right now? What are some self-care practices that you're doing? And it's a tricky one because I think a lot of us <laughs> don't always do the self-care. Looking through the comments here, these are just so awesome. Reading, drawing, painting, coffee, saying no, huge, trying to make lunch, taking a break every day, blocking time, mindfulness. These are great. Um, another way, and we used to do a lot of lunch and learns, um, but you can do that virtually or if people just don't want to get together in that way, if you have someone, um, I don't I don't teach yoga anymore, but I, I sort of a yoga instructor and I, I taught years ago. Um, you could have someone and potentially someone within your organization does that and is able to tape something and then people can do that on their own time. Or does your organization have a subscription to um, meditation app or, or something that you can suggest or something that you can do that's huge. And even putting together little kits for your team, one of the roles I was in, it was, it, we could choose between one of five self-care things. Um, and some of it was was paint by number, subscription to like a mindfulness app, a salt lamp, and they can be very um, inexpensive things. Um, but doing that to one show that self-care and, and that's really important, but to help people do it in the way that makes sense to them or putting together self-care kits um, for yourself, for the team, pet therapy, that's so great. Blocking time off your calendar. So many great ideas. Perfect. Thank you so much. I love that. Um, and I'll put these together too for you as well. Food reset, dinners with family at the table, no distractions. These are so, so wonderful. So we talked now about how you did this for yourself. How have you been doing it for your team? How have you been showing your team that self-care is really important and they matter? What have you been giving back to your team in that way? Whether you're an individual contributor or a colleague, how have you helped your team really make self-care important for them? So, so you can, again, this all builds, this builds community, this builds relationships, this shows that you care with one another. Oh, I love that, volunteering with animals. That's so great. Yes, that's great, Tara. And always encouraging coworkers to set healthy boundaries. And I think to do that, we have to do it. We have to be able to do it ourselves. And, and it's not just the um, tell people, but show people that we're setting healthy boundaries. We're taking time for ourselves. How else has everybody been able to do that for their colleagues and been able to support them as they're working through right now? And I want to go back to um, a previous comment too. I apologize, I can't remember who said it, but to someone who mentioned how do we get in contact with students who who may not be reaching out to us. This another suggestion of something to even do. It sort of goes along with that. Um, but when you're sending emails to students, if there's a way that you can even see if they're opening the emails, because if they're not opening or see, or if they're opening the emails and not clicking and responding, that at least they know, you know that they're getting this information. They may or may not want to ask a question. They may or may not want to follow up with it. But is there a way that you can see if they're opening up your emails and just not responding or finding a different way to communicate them with them. Again, um, finding out the best way or where they are. If there's a connection that, that you're trying to reach someone, and again, it depends on which re reason behind it is or what you want to do. Is there somebody who's connected to them that can circle back and say that, you know, Alyssa's really concerned about you. Is everything okay? Can you reach out to her? Like, is there an intermediary or is there a connection there? It can be a student friend. It can be another staff member that I might be able, maybe able to do that for you. Peer mentors, peer mentorship. Yes. That's major. I love that. And that can be done virtually too. Um, working with with peer mentors or helping people through. And what's great is, and when I do a lot of things in, 
in the workforce in terms of helping specifically teams work together, even doing reverse mentorship. So peer mentorship um, can even be it, that same, but thinking that just because you're a senior or a junior and somebody is a freshman doesn't mean the freshman can't explain stuff or do things. It's building that relationship where they both can help one another out. Um, maybe the freshman is more familiar with um, something maybe outside of the school, but maybe a social media application or a process or something that they've been thinking about and where um, the junior or senior is more nuanced on the school piece of it. Um, but having, creating those relationships for people who want it, um, even suggesting it to other people who might be interested in it. These are so wonderful. And the question was asked, um, is anyone using peer counseling virtually? Um, and that to me would be something different. So if anybody wants to share in those comments below um, what you're doing for peer, what program, if there's a specific program or application that you're using for that, that would be great um, to help Juliana out. What other questions, concerns, comments, something that you're trying to work through? And I love, again, that reinventing the wheel. Great question, Juliana, of what are you using? What are people doing? Um, so not to create something that's already been created. New staff shadow, more experienced colleagues. Yes, and again, you can do this virtually. Um, if you're onboarding people during this time, people, again, don't know what they don't know. So if you're bringing in new staff members, you automatically want to make them feel connected to the people that they're going to be working with. And they might not know who they might be working with, with outside of the department. They might know your immediate staff. So even scheduling in advance some 15-minute chats with them, connecting that, adding things maybe to their calendar, or giving them, here are some people you might want to talk with that you might be working with. Um, creating that connection immediately can be really helpful. So they're building that relationship one-on-one -on -one with different people who they might be working with. So for example, when I worked in academic affairs and, and advising, we also worked really closely with the people in student affairs in Wharton. But I wouldn't have known that virtually. So if somebody helped me and made me a list of people that I can reach out to or already set up some quick meetings, that would have been really helpful. So then we can start working together to help our student holistically. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Amy, so much for sharing that um, in order to do peer counseling, they're doing more all internal. So something with Zoom and Teams, part of their student success team. Yeah, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Again, I'm, I'm looking through. There's a lot of great stuff um, in this chat here. So I just want to look through and see what comes up here. These are amazing. Um, I want to bring it back to if um, Kim mentioned like interns or graduate assistants, giving them kind of some responsibility. Are there things that you've done um, to either utilize the resources of graduate assistants or interns or people in your office at that level that can be really helpful for the rest of the group to know? One, so they can gain a good experience virtually, but also so they might be able to help out with some of the other things when you're talking with connecting with students, some of the other nuances. If you want to share in in the comments here, some of the ways that you've been able to really take advantage of the experience of graduate assistants and interns, um, that would be great because I think that they can be a really valuable resource right now. Again, I'm looking through the comments to see, and I will send emails. So the 10 people um, that will get emails, I'll just need your addresses and I'll send the information to you. Um, Allison Moots, Kim, Slano, Sarah, and Sally, uh, Preeti, Darcy, Parker, Tara, have you all in there? Ms. Hayes, yeah, this year. These are amazing, I'll, and I promise I'll send everybody an email. This year we started involving student workers in our recruitment process to give them professional development, reviewing resumes, yes, creating interviews. And honestly, they might be really in touch with what's going on um, in terms of the virtual space or applications or things to be able to use. That can be really, really helpful for them. Yeah. These are, these are truly, truly amazing. And I'm excited that so many of you are thinking about using templates and reply emails um, 
I think this can be really helpful in, in piecing things together. Voice um, will be great for so many of you and in keeping that, the paperless post um, and, and sending those cards, the Jamboard, the future. There's some really, really great um, ideas and things that everybody's been coming up with. And I love how um, you've been able to help one another through this and be able to talk to one another. And, and remember, right, this we're talking about connecting right now and moving forward. So building these connections now, hopefully in the fall, we'll see more people on campus um, and that'll be a huge, huge difference. And they'll know you, they won't be afraid of you. They'll know what you look like. They'll know the space that you're in and you're able to keep, keep building those connections and those relationships moving forward. Um, it was, you're going from high school to college. You might not physically have been there. You're there very randomly. You just don't, you don't know. Um, you don't know where people have have built those connections. So to be able to to see that for you virtually and see that space behind you and your kids and your dog and your coffee or whatever that case may be, you're able to continue to have that space um, and really work with one another and continue the conversations moving forward. So I really, really appreciate everyone being so vulnerable and really uh, um, apologize about the technology. It was not coming up and I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I will 100% send everybody the deck. Um, so have the deck with the building connections, open communication, supporting collaboration. You'll have all of that there and the things we talked about as well as the resources. So it'll be a Google doc with all of the resources you can use, including project management tools and the how-to guides for Google Voice and everything that we mentioned. And I love, um, Somebody mentioned that you were able to get the transcript for this, so we'll be able to look back and see all the goodness here. Thank you so much, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoy. I'm excited you have a networking session coming up. So that's great. Hi, everyone. Um, just coming back quickly um, to say thank you, Alyssa, for such a great session. Um, it truly felt like a conversation to me with the chat usage. So thank you to all of our attendees as well for um, participating and engaging today. Um, and thank you for our attendees who maybe have joined us every Friday this month. Um, we will, as Alyssa said, and um, DBSAC committee posted in the in the chat there, um, we will make sure you get the slides, the recording from today and, and resources. Um, so those will be sent out. And then Alyssa will be coordinating with those of you who won books. Um, so she'll coordinate via email and get mailing addresses to get those out. Um, we would love for you now to join us in the networking area if you're interested, um, where you'll be able to chat with colleagues. So to do so, you can simply click on the networking on the left side of your screen and then click the blue ready button when you're ready to be randomly matched with another attendee. It will be a video chat by default, but you'll be able to turn off your video by clicking the video camera if you choose. Um, and then you'll have up to three minutes to chat, but you can click the extend button if you'd both like to chat longer. You'll also be able to end the chat before three minutes is up by clicking the leave button. And then if you both click the blue connect button at the top of the screen, you're able to see each other's email addresses in the connection section of your Hopin account. Before you leave the event today, I would like to please remind you to check out our sponsors by clicking on their logo um, to visit their website and also to complete our brief post-session evaluation. Both of those things can be found back in the reception area where you first joined. And if you've enjoyed the sessions this month and are interested in joining our DVSAC planning committee, please go ahead and submit the interest form linked in the reception area as well. We are, as Allison mentioned, always looking for new members and new ideas to share. Um, and then also please be on the lookout for updates for us in the coming year as we plan for 2022, um, when fingers crossed we can be back at an in-person event again. So thank you all. Thank you.